good afternoon. We're 30 minutes earlier than yesterday, so we're making an effort. Uh, I don't have anything at the top, so Matt, let's start with you. Well, that's quite a coincidence, because I don't really have anything at the top either. I do have one thing that's kind of, uh, that I think will be very brief, and okay. that is just, you have, um, we understand that the, um, this American who had been arrested in uh, UAE is on his way home mm -hmm. now, maybe as an already arrived. Do you have anything to say about that? Uh, I can confirm that uh, he has departed uh, the UAE. Uh, he departed uh, on January 9th, which is today, after serving his sentence and being deported. Uh, the, I also wanted to note, while I don't have an update on his uh, exact arrival or travel plans, given he's a private citizen, uh, we did re uh, visit with him. We visited with him regularly, of course, including uh, as recently as yesterday morning. So I can confirm that he, was, uh, he has been deported. Uh, okay, but uh, is this a welcome development? Certainly, absolutely. Uh, as you know, uh, we've consistently raised this issue uh, about his arrest and trial specifically with UAE officials. We have continuously pressed for a fair and expedient re resolution as we were deeply concerned uh, by the verdict. Uh, as you know, uh, just to give some others some history who maybe haven't followed this as closely, he was sentenced to one year in prison, a fine uh, and deportation. He was, as I, I confirmed, the deportation piece of it, um, but uh, obviously it's a welcome development. All right, and so do you believe that this was a fair and expedient resolution? Uh, well, uh, I, I wouldn't say that. Obviously, we expressed concerns about the fact that he was arrested to begin with, but obviously we're pleased that it's been resolved. Okay. But do you know what happened to, there were some other people who were UAE nationals, I believe. Mm -hmm. Do you know what's happened to them? Are they still in court? Are they well, are still in jail, sorry? Uh, we, we understand that some defendants have played, may have played different roles in the production of the video. I don't have any other updates on them. I'm happy to check and see if there is. How much does this case and, you know, factor into your discussions with the UAE mm -hmm. about its reform process and free speech and, you know, political, um, you know, being able to have a, a political dialogue in the country? I mean. Presumably, these are issues in your dialogue with the Sure, UAE and, and we have, uh, as I just noted, repeatedly raised this specific case, uh, as well as any other case were applicable uh, with the UAE. Uh, as you know, uh, anywhere around the world, including in discussions with the UAE, we express uh, any concerns we have when we don't feel that uh, freedom of media, freedom of speech, freedom of expression is being respected. And we certainly had uh, significant concerns about the arrest to begin with. Uh, so we express, the, expre express those consistently through the process. So that would mean that you have, um, you know, concerns about, you know, this, this national security law, for instance, that any type of media that criticizes the government um, is kind of not in accordance with the ideas of a free press and a, and a free political society. Certainly, and anywhere in the world, as you know, when there are uh, uh, actions that are taken, uh, whether that's legislation or arrests uh, that uh, limit freedom of media and freedom of expression, we consistently express our concern. But you didn't express your concern about this until today. About this specific case? Or about this national security law and whether this video, I mean, it sounds now that you feel like I don't have anything more specifically gone. on the law and I don't have the details of the law, um, so I'd have to check with our team on that. But in general was the point I was making about uh, how we express concerns as they come about. And did you have any, just to go back to the others who were detained with this, mm -hmm. um, with this young guy, um, do you have concerns about their detention and their arrest and their charges? Uh, you know, Joe, I don't have any more details on it, so let me check well, with our uh, team and see if there's more we can it just express that on that. They were all arrested around the same thing. Sure. Charged with the same sort of thing. So mm -hmm. even though they're not American nationals, I would imagine that your concern might well, certainly extend to them. Too. We've expressed on many occasions concerns we have broadly, whether they're American citizens or not, even when they're citizens of the individual country, which isn't applicable here, but uh, when there are efforts to limit uh, freedom of speech and freedom of expression, that would certainly be the case here. Obviously, if someone's not an American citizen, we wouldn't be as knowledgeable about the details of, of uh, their arrest or their events or what was happening with their cases. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, what's your understanding of this release or whatever, deported, I mean, it's the charges were dropped or, or the case was dropped or just like an, ex like an example from being punished? Uh, all the details I have is that uh, after serving his sentence, he's been deported. Uh, beyond that, I don't have any other details of the legal status. So he's not, you don't know if he's going to be on trial again or he has to be 
on trial again later or whatever. I don't have any more details uh, other than what I've shared on this specific case. Can I go to the round? Sure. Geneva. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the talks began today, but um, we're hearing from our team on the ground that um, there hasn't been any meeting between um, Wendy Sherman and her Iranian counterpart. Would you be able to fill us in on exactly what, it, what, what happened? Uh, sure. Well, that's incorrect. Um, as agreed, um, the U.S. delegation, uh, led by Undersecretary Sherman, uh, provided uh, Deputy uh, General Schmidt and Iranian Deputy Foreign Minister Arachi views and information that was useful to discussions to address any remaining issues. Uh, to the agreement to the Joint Plan of Action. This was, of course, done uh, fully in coordination with the EU. Uh, on the margins, Under Secretary Sherman also had a bilateral meeting uh, with Iran uh, to help inform this process. Uh, as you know, because we announced her travel yesterday, she's uh, soon moving uh, forward to the next stage of her trip, uh, but those are the events that have happened on the ground. She's, is she still in Geneva? Uh, I don't have her exact location at this moment, but she, uh, as you know, has many other uh, stops planned. Uh, so uh, my understanding is she's moving on to those uh, soon, if she hasn't already. And you didn't mention whether there was any agreement on when the implementation of the November 24th deal uh, might There's go no ahead. update on that. Uh, obviously, there are still uh, remaining issues, as there were. They're working through those, and uh, so I don't have any update to tell you about on that front. What's the, what's the most difficult <coughs> issue that you're working through at the moment? Uh, we're not going to outline that publicly uh, because uh, what the, our focus is on is resolving these issues privately through these channels, and we're working toward that. As we've said a few times, we, uh, there are only a few issues we're working through, and, uh, and we'll leave that to our teams on the ground to continue well, to do. I mean, are, are there fewer now than there were before this meeting? Are, are you I'm not going to. I don't have you any know? other out, update to provide for all of you. Yes, I mean, this is some concern because the deal was agreed like almost six weeks ago now, mm -hmm. roughly. And um, within that time, because there's no actual implementation date, it's not binding on either side yet. So you could have a situation where Iran could still be, um, you know, using its centrifuges, could still be, um, mm -hmm. you know, enriching uranium. Is What is your understanding of what's happening on the ground in Iran at the moment? Uh, well, again, uh, you know, I think uh, obviously we're watching what's happening closely, but until the implementation starts, uh, technically uh, both sides are not, uh, are not uh, uh, tied to what was agreed to. Obviously what happened six weeks ago was uh, a significant step forward, a historic step forward. We knew because these issues were so complicated and complex that it would take some time to work through on the technical experts level. Some of the implementation pieces were in the midst of that, and of course we uh, would like to see uh, that, that timeline of the, the six months timeline start uh, as soon as we can. But do you know whether anything still ha is happening on the ground in Iran? I, I don't have any updates to provide uh, for all of you on that or anything to indicate concern. Uh, obviously, uh, if those come up, we'll, we'll address them. If, but, but, but gentlemen, if it is correct that you allow mm -hmm. that because there is no implementation deal, neither side is bound to what was agreed to on November 24th. Well, that's Why is there this big stink over at the White House about the President going to veto this Iran sanctions bill? Well, it's important, Matt, that that's technically. Um, and so, yes, technically. Yeah, However, technically, this is also, you... let me finish, this is also a question of the spirit of the negotiations, of how to maintain uh, things moving forward on the path toward implementation and beyond implementation toward a comprehensive agreement. So it's not just about the understanding surrounding the text, it's also about uh, what the parties thought during the negotiations, what they discussed, uh, how to maintain and seize this opportunity that's the best one we've had in a decade to move towards a diplomatic solution. And that's the argument we're making to Congress and why we've been so firm in our okay. resolution so on this. So it's, it's not because you're bound or you believe that you're bound at this current moment in time by the agreement not to have these san this sanctions bill become law, it is because you believe that that is in keeping with the spirit of the negotiations and not basically And obviously traitor. putting that, new legislation in place, Matt, would yeah. not just be a, a one-day thing. Okay. It would be something that would be law moving forward. Right. So technically, let me just mention this because somebody asked this yesterday. Um, the uh, understanding surrounding the text is the implementation of existing measures is permitted within the scope of the text, uh, but creating new sanctions authorities so, or as legislation or a new executive order would be not. But again, our larger point here is still that that is uh, immaterial because this is also about uh, our uh, 
negotiating in good faith and delivering on the promise we made with the P5 plus one as well as the Iranians. Fair enough, but you're not actually bound by that agreement until there's an implementation deal done. Right? Technically, no, right. but okay. also we want to move forward, continue I, to move I understand forward. That. I Keep understand going. That. So is, the, is it then the administration's position that Iran and its actions since, the, since November 24th has also been uh, keeping in the spirit of the negotiation and in the spirit of going forward and making progress? I don't have anything uh, to report to you that that, that hasn't been the case. Uh, obviously, uh, if that were, we'd, we could speak to and that. Just at a the clarification, time. was there a three-way meeting and the bilateral? Correct. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Any more in Iran? Okay. Uh, Scott? The uh, Chinese seem to have uh, significantly expanded the area in the South China Sea in which they say that commercial fishermen must receive permission from the Chinese government to fish. Mm -hmm. Is there any reaction from the United States? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe you're referring to the uh, Hainan provincial restrictions. Uh, the passing of these restrictions on other countries' fishing activities in disputed portions of the South China Sea is a provocative and potentially dangerous act. These, regu these regulations appear to apply to the maritime space within China's so-called nine-dash line. China has not offered any explanation or basis under international law for these extensive maritime claims. In general, the United States has counseled that these maritime disputes in the South China Sea not be uh, decided unilaterally, mm -hmm. but worked through ASEAN. So is it your view that this is a unilateral decision that is against your advice to those involved to settle this through ASEAN? Well, certainly. I think, uh, at, to your point, our longstanding position has been that all concerned parties uh, should avoid any unilateral action that raises tensions and undermines the prospects for a diplomatic or other peaceful resolution of differences. And uh, clearly, uh, uh, passing uh, legislation that uh, claims ownership over territory in a disputed area would certainly uh, be, a, be uh, of concern to us, as I express. Um, Can I follow the subject to Afghanistan? Sure. Do, do we have any more in China? Go ahead. Um, so do you have any thoughts on Japan's willingness and calls to establish an emergency hotline with China, given the uptick in, in maritime tensions? Uh, I haven't seen that specifically. Uh, as we've long said, uh, we support efforts uh, by uh, either country to, uh, to resolve differences through dialogue. Uh, so if that's an effort toward that, uh, that would be positive. But I'd have to check with our team and see if there's more specific uh, reaction to that. Uh, Hainan province announcement. Mm -hmm. How are you going to advise your United States commercial vessels or whatever to trying to do activities in that area? I don't have any update on that. Obviously, this announcement just uh, came out. Um, uh, but beyond that, I'll see if there's more we have to add on that front. Afghanistan? Um, yes. Sorry, Afghan. just do you know if you have raised this directly to the Chinese? We have. Mm -hmm. That would be there? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, the, decision, the announcement by um, the Afghans that they are going to release a, a large majority mm -hmm. of the detainees. Just wondering if you have any reaction to that, if you're in discussions um, about possible, if they are going to do it about possible um, monitoring measures of these um, mm -hmm. individuals to make sure they don't? Uh, well, as would come as no surprise, I expect a statement will be coming out from DOD. But let me just reiterate some of, the, uh, some of our views from here. We have expressed our concerns over the possible release of these detainees without their cases being referred to the Afghan criminal justice system. Uh, we've seen reports, as you noted, that President Karzai has approved the release of 72 of the 88 detainees under review. Uh, as you may also know, uh, these 72 detainees are dangerous criminals against whom there is strong evidence linking them to terror-related crimes, including the use of improvised explosive devices, the largest killer of Afghan civilians. Uh, these insurgents <coughs> who pose threats to the safety and security of the Afghan people and the state are being released without an investigation and without the use of criminal justice system in accordance with Afghan law. Uh, among um, their release also undermines Afghanistan's court system and rule of law because the Afghan pe people do not get their day in court. In terms of any other uh, pieces, in terms of how it would be dealt with, I would refer you to DOD. Well, but I mean, you, the State Department has in large part been dealing with um, the Afghans sure. on, on the larger issues of, of mm -hmm. that type of stuff. I mean, what about um, 
any type of monitoring measures of these individuals when they, I mean, that's something that this department was involved in, for instance, when you sent Guantanamo detainees back from Australia. I don't have any update on that. My understanding is that would probably fall under the purview of DOD, but I can check and see if there's anything we have or any involvement from here in that piece. How do you view this decision? Do you view this decision um, as a, impacting the relationship or negotiations on the BSA? Well, um, on the BSA, as you know, our, our view continues to be, uh, despite these reports, that uh, it's not only uh, desired by the United States for the Afghans to sign the BSA, but it's in the interest of the Afghan people, uh, and it's in the interest of the Afghan government to sign <coughs> the BSA. So uh, time will tell uh, whether there is an impact, but obviously uh, this is a report that we have concerns about. At the same time, we continue to work toward uh, and make our case for why it's important to sign the BSA as quickly as possible. Uh, Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, in general, usually it's in the military side we are, you are like uh, putting on the table the option, zero option. Mm -hmm. And is there an equivalent to it in the nation building option? I'm not sure I understand uh, your question. I mean, I'm trying to say if like, if you don't come to an agreement regarding the military mm -hmm. or security arrangements. Sure. How it's going to affect the other project that o over those years are almost ten, ten, more than ten years now, all this nation building project, and I assume there is a diplomatic and uh, economic relation. Mm -hmm. Are these things are going to be affected or not? Well, uh, as you know, uh, if we can't conclude a BSA promptly, uh, we will initiate planning for a post-2014 uh, future in which there's no U.S. or NATO troop presence in Afghanistan. Obviously, those troops would not be playing a role, a combat role, they'd be playing a train, advise, and assist role. There are a range of programs, to your point, that uh, that would be uh, part of that, certainly. I don't have an outline or detail of that, as in we're not in that stage at this point. But uh, it would be challenging, and this is an important point we perhaps haven't made enough, um, which is that it's not just about the United States and NATO planning, it's also about Congress planning. and even ask for, uh, for funding or assistance for a variety of programs. It makes it more challenging for Congress to plan when there isn't certainty about what the future will be either. So uh, the answer is we don't know yet, but uh, obviously there are a range of interests we have in Afghanistan. I don't have any predictions for you on what the impact would be because we're not at that point yet. Speaking of the Hill, there was quite a lot of chatter up there uh, this morning and I think right now going on, Senators McCain and Graham mm -hmm. and also Speaker Boehner are talking about Iraq mm -hmm. and um, the need for the administration to get more engaged. Is there, any new, is there anything new on that uh, support for the Maliki government uh, in its fight that you can offer us today? Um, Sure. Well, one, let me just refute uh, some of that criticism, or all of that criticism, I suspect, uh, which is that uh, the United States, uh, the State Department, the White House, uh, the administration writ large has been very deeply and closely engaged uh, in Iraq consistently. Uh, we've talked a bit in here about uh, about Deputy Assistant Secretary Brett McGurk's uh, work uh, to push for unity uh, in the region, our efforts to uh, work with, in, in, recent, uh, in recent days, I should say, to work uh, with the uh, Iraqi government to uh, develop strategies, our efforts to accelerate assistance. Uh, but this has been consistent, and it would be inaccurate to assume that this is just a recent effort on behalf of the United States. Obviously, we're talking about it in the news these days. Um, I can. Did you have any specific? Uh, well, pieces? I mean, the way, you know, uh, Chairman Menendez has been talking about how he's willing to allow certain set, the provision of certain things mm -hmm. that were blocked before mm -hmm. to go through. Now, there were, I believe, helicopters. There were mm -hmm. um, fighter jets, you know, planes that were that, that were stopped. Is the, does the administration see any way of getting uh, of getting that stuff to the Iraqi? Well, um, as you know, and we've talked a bit in here about uh, accelerating assistance, and as part of our FMS program, uh, we would certainly support, the administration would certainly support providing Apaches, especially given the situation on the ground. Obviously, that's something that we are working with Congress on. We're in close contact uh, with Congress on, and we'll continue that, those consultations, but we would support that. Just to put a finer point on mm -hmm. you said you would support it, but are you lobbying Congress? to get them to approve it. We wouldn't call it lobbying. Oh, we maybe we not support lobbying. it. So, not 
I know you support the idea mm -hmm. of it. Do you want to provide them, and are you trying to get Congress to say yes? We are working with Congress on that exactly. Yes. I'll take that as a yes. Iraq? Mm -hmm. uh, what is your assessment of what's going on in Iraq? Because you are now some people are critical of your involvement or not being involved in anything. I mean, because at the end, I don't know if, if you think it's, it's a civil war is going on or what? Well, uh, there's a lot in there, so let me try and see if I can address it um, We can, with just an update on where things stand today. And obviously, we're monitoring it closely day by day, and we're in very close contact with uh, the government of Iraq. Uh, we continue to follow, of course, events in Iraq's Anbar province very closely as the situation remains volatile. Iraqi tribes and Iraqi security forces continue to consult on options to confront extremists in the city of Fallujah. The situation in Ramadi remains more stable as it has in for the past couple of days with the advances Iraqi tribes have made with the support of Iraqi security forces in regaining control of the city. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we remain in close contact both uh, from both Washington and Baghdad with all of Iraq's political leaders at the highest levels. I know the White House has read out a couple of calls that uh, the Vice President has done. I read out a call yesterday that the Secretary uh, did. Uh, we note uh, the recent Iraqi Council of Ministers confirmation that the Iraqi army will continue to support local police and local tribes in Anbar as they combat al-Qaeda. The Con Council of Ministers also decided that Anbar tribesmen killed in the fight against al-Qaeda will be granted the same benefits and compensation as Iraqi soldiers and that the government will cover the medical expenses of tribesmen wounded in the fight. So we are encouraged, and <coughs> finally, last point I'll make is we are encouraged by uh, Prime Minister Maliki's call in his weekly address for unity and political dialogue in the face of the terrorist threat and by his commitment to the democratic process and to uh, the holding of elections as scheduled. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, obviously we're continuing to work with uh, the government of Iraq to develop strategies. Uh, and uh, and as, you, as we've noted a couple of times, we continue to provide military equipment uh, as well. Uh, as well. So just to, be, to clarify, I mean, for sure you know that now is Al Qaeda in Iraq, right? This uh, is, I mean, they are taking positions, Fallujah and other places. I don't think there's been a question about that, but. No, I mean like. It's not affiliates or alumnus or whatever that, that Lucas was trying to say about Libya yesterday. I, Iraq is, Qaeda is, we are facing. Yeah, we I are think he was a, asking a, se a separate question about a separate issue. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm mm -hmm. just, we are, I mean, U.S. is facing Qaeda now. Our Iraq is facing Al Qaeda Iraq. In, mm -hmm. in Iraq. Any more on Iraq? Yeah. Oh. Are you considering sending in more military advisors to Iraq? given the situation? Uh, I would uh, point you to DOD. I don't have any information to suggest that, but obviously we're evaluating day by day. On North Korea? Well, let's finish Iraq. Do you have Iraq or something yeah, else? Right. Okay, Iraq, Scott, yeah. or no? Okay. Uh, North Korea, and we'll go, yeah. to, go to next year. Joe. Go ahead. North Korea? Okay. Uh, United States and South Korea agreed North Korea-related uh, uh, concern consultation on a building in case of a North Korea sudden collapse of uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, regime. Do you have any specific information on that? Can you, I'm sorry, can you say the beginning part one more time? Consultation on what? what? Cont, uh, cons, U.S. and South Korea agreed North Korea related uh, uh, consultation on building. Uh, well, I don't know if this answers your question, but as you may know, the South Korean foreign minister was here yesterday. I gave a readout of that yesterday, which I'd point you to, and mm -hmm. a big focus of the meeting was certainly <coughs> coordination and consultation as it relates to the threat from North Korea. Do you have anything on the sudden collapse of the North Korean regimes? So do you have any scenario of a, any detail of a scenario? I, I don't have anything uh, beyond uh, what I provided yesterday in terms of a consultation, About which is Mr. pretty recent. Thank you. About the Mr. Lodeman, um, as you know that uh, yesterday Ms. Mr. Lodeman and, uh, celebrated Kim Jong-un's birthday, and uh, Mr. Lodeman became a North Korean dictator propaganda. And how do the United States uh, respond to this, his actions in North Korea? Well, I've spoken about this quite a bit in the last couple of days, but let me just say that uh, sports exchanges, uh, as you may know, we view as uh, as valuable and are something that can be pursued in many places. Uh, and of course the U.S. government supports that and we, uh, we work with uh, many countries on those programs. Uh, but I'd point you to 
uh, the statement issued a couple of days ago about uh, from NBA Commissioner Stern that said uh, that there's an appropriate time and place for such sports diplomacy, uh, and obviously uh, this is not an example of that. But the North Korea paid all his group's ex expenses, mm -hmm. like uh, air tickets and everything. But uh, he also bring into uh, you know expensive whiskeys, mink coat to uh, Kim Jong Un. You know that's a lot, uh, ten thousand dollar, over ten thousand dollar gift to the, the, the them and uh, dictators. Mm -hmm. I, he's a private citizen. I just don't think I'll have any more comments on it. Are, yeah. are there any type of U.S. sanctions that would prohibit anything yeah. like that? I'm happy to check. I'm, I'm not aware of what the sanctions I'm, would be. Well, I know that there is, mm -hmm. there are, under the UN sanctions, mm -hmm. there are certain sanctions against luxury goods. Yes. Um, Providing gifts of. I think it was for sale. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We'll check. Uh, yeah. I'm Can happy check to check and see, and see if yeah. there's more to report on that. Okay. Scott? Uh, mm -hmm. We heard the Linda Thomas Greenfield testimony today, and she answered some of the questions that we mm -hmm. had here about uh, the coup or not coup. But to the question of these uh, Riyak Machar detainees in Juba, from the podium uh, this week, you've called for their release. Mm -hmm. The Kir government says, well, they're, you know, alleged coup plotters, and South Sudan has a system of justice that will, you know, carry on as it should. So what are you doing there about that? Uh, we're continuing to press that we believe that uh, these detainees should be released as quickly as possible. We're disappointed that they have not been released. Uh, to Joe's question uh, yesterday, uh, we don't believe that the detainees sh the release of the detainees should be a precondition for a halt to the fighting, uh, which I think is a really important point. And the role that they could play is uh, some of them par would be participating in the negotiations, and that's the importance, one of the important components of their release. Um, so we're continuing to press that on the ground. Uh, the uh, talks are ongoing. The mediators returned from Juba uh, last night. Uh, Special Envoy, Envoy Booth met with them last night, uh, and they also uh, were able to see uh, the detainees. Uh, they reported that the de detainees are in good health and continue to be willing to participate in a political dialogue. Are you coming down more on the side of the of um the former Vice President Marshall by calling for the release of these detainees. There was a statement from uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield mm -hmm. today that the, that the United States has no evidence that there was a coup attempt. It would seem to suggest that you might be supporting more the side of the uh, of the former Vice President than the than the side of the President. Uh, I don't. It's not from the United States. It's not an effort on behalf of the, by the United States to take one side. Uh, our goal here is not where this started, to focus on where this started, but where it's going to end. And the important piece here is the one I just touched on, which is that these detainees could play a role in the discussions and negotiations. And what we're trying to do here is get to a point where there's an end to the uh, to the violence and the and the hostilities. Any more in South Sudan? No, go ahead. No, I've got one on Turkey though. Okay. Um, can we, can we go to the situation in Turkey where there's been a building political crisis since mm -hmm. um, Erdogan sacked, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan sacked um, about 700 police officers. Mm -hmm. Yesterday there were moves to try and curb some of the powers of the um, country's leading independent judicial body, and today there's more moves to impose strict controls on the internet. I wondered if you could give us a broad kind of over, overview of the U.S. Uh, position on this. Uh, well, you're right, and as you pointed to, it's been ongoing, and there have been different developments uh, each day. Uh, in our <coughs> conversations with all stakeholders in Turkey, uh, we continue to make clear that the United States supports the desire of the Turkish people for a legal system that meets the highest standards of fairness, timeliness, and transparency in civil and criminal matters. Uh, where no one is above the law and where allegations against public figures are investigated impartially. Uh, you are familiar with uh, our view on freedom of speech and freedom of media, which we've expressed uh, as needed and, and expressed annually in our report as well, and we're certainly communicating that directly uh, to the government. At what level? Um, from whom in this building? Uh, I don't have any uh, readouts or, or updates on calls from uh, Washington, but certainly it's being communicated on the ground. So are, are there concerns that this could lead to instability? And what is a key U.S. Uh, ally in that region? Uh, you're right that Turkey is and remains a key U.S. ally. Um, we're not going to get ahead of where we are now. We've expressed our concerns about some of the events that are happening on the ground, directly, publicly, and privately, and we'll continue to do that. But, um, I mean, this there's been, since the summer, really, all this political unrest mm -hmm. and um, 
a lot of violence related to how um, Prime Minister Erdogan has been treating the opposition. Do you do you think that Tur this makes Turkey a less reliable ally if there's so much kind of chaos in, in the country? And they're uh, diverted dealing with this domestic instability? Well, at least certainly I would not qualify it that way from the United States government. Uh, we express concerns when we have them, as I just did in this case. Uh, we've had them in the past, and when we've had them in the past, we've expressed them. But uh, Turkey remains uh, an important ally. It remains a country we work closely with on a range of issues, and when we have concerns, we'll make I those known. I didn't say it wasn't an important ally. I'm asking about the reliability in terms of you know, the stability of the government, the security of the government, whether, um, you know, they are too preoccupied with their own domestic chaos mm -hmm. to be a um, reliable and productive partner with you in other arenas. Well, I, I don't think we want to make a prediction of that. Uh, as you know, Turkey is, uh, will be participating in a range of discussions about uh, Syria and the crisis in Syria. They're obviously an important uh, partner on that. We work with them on other issues. So, so you uh, haven't <laughs> seen over the last, what, six months that this political instability and chaos and uh, you know, per periodic violence in Turkey has not um, affected your business with them? We've continued to work closely with Turkey, and obviously we've expressed concerns about issues going on domestically as we see fit. Yes, well, thank you. Uh, do you consider Mr. Erdogan um, a leader who respects uh, democracy since he dismissed judges and prosecutors, since he put more than 1,000 journalists in jail? Is he a leader that, uh, well, uh, that he respects democracy, you think? I will say that when we have concerns about his actions, we express those, uh, and that's something I have just done today. Do we have any more in Turkey? Okay. Syria, go ahead. Uh, do you have any response to Germany's announcement that they are willing to help in the disposal of Syria's chemical weapons? Uh, well, as we've uh, said for uh, several months now, fortunately, uh, we certainly support the efforts of uh, and the engagement of countries around the world to play a contributing role. I would point you to the OPCW on specifically what part they would play or uh, what part it would be appropriate to play. but. Uh, we've been having discussions, as has the OPCW, about with a range of countries for months about how to contribute to this effort. Including Germany? Uh, I, I don't have anything specific okay. for you, but it's safe to say that I'm, the OPCW has been broadly reaching out, as has the UN, as has the State Department. So I don't have any qualification for you on who's called whom, but uh, we've, we've all made a range of contacts. Syria? Mm -hmm. Another question. It's related to the refugees. Mm -hmm. I mean, UN uh, for... A while ago, they put the numbers, which is, has to be completed by like asking for many dozens of countries to be to at least thirty or forty thousand refugees to be settled. Uh, do you have anything about what U.S. The United is States is doing is doing in that regard? Mm -hmm. uh, well, let me give you all a little background here because this is a complicated issue, and there are a lot of steps that it has to uh, go through. You mentioned, which is is certainly true, is that. Uh, we've gone from, it, Syria has gone from about 200,000 refugees in 2012 to 2.3 million over the course of a year. Obviously, that's one of the reasons why this has been raised at, at the decibel it's been raised. Uh, it typically takes about five years before a crisis triggers mechanisms for uh, the UNHCR, before they believe resettlement should play a significant role in its response. Uh, they've decided that this humanitarian crisis, and this has uh, been the, the prompter of their recent statements, already meets that threshold. So that's a unique uh, case. Uh, only a small percentage of all refugees uh, t typically, uh, regardless of the crisis, are resettled in a third country. Uh, our primary goal uh, and the primary goal of the UN has been typically to provide humanitarian assistance and protection in the place uh, to which they have fled, uh, but also most refugees want to return back. Um, uh, that's typically how uh, it goes. Uh, right now, there are currently 112 Syrian nationals in the pipeline in the United States. Uh, we expect many more referrals in 2014. Uh, we have historically accepted the majority of UNHCR's total number of referrals for resettlement uh, worldwide. Uh, we admit more refugees to the United States each year than the rest of the world combined. That is, it was about 70,000 in 2013, which is obviously a large number. Uh, so, getting back to your point, I just wanted to provide the context. 
Um, UNHCR has announced that it intends to refer up to 30,000 Syrians to a number of partner countries for temporary or permanent resettlement by the end of 2014. Uh, the United States stands ready to fully participate in this effort. Uh, the process here that is, uh, that is mandated by Congress is deliberate. It takes some time. It ensures uh, that valid, uh, bona fide applications come through, which is, uh, of course, uh, necessary. So given the deliberate nature of our process, uh, we expect relatively few of the individuals will actually arrive in 2014. Uh, the process typically takes between 18 and 24 months. Uh, so that's a bit that's of a summary of where things stand here. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I'm just trying to have ask, ask another question regarding Syria mm -hmm. and the humanitarian aid, which is sure. going to be discussed, I assume, in Kuwait mm -hmm. in the secretary visit. Uh, what is What are the main points that they are going to be discussed, I mean, in that Kuwait meeting, I assume not the refugee issues, I mean, like the settlement of the refugees, or it's a part of it, well, or it's this just is like to, to feed them and uh, give them blanket or all these things? Well, this is the second annual, as I understand it, donors conference, so obviously they'll discuss <coughs> ways to provide aid and assistance. Uh, that's the primary focus of it. Clearly on the uh, margins of that, they can discuss a range of issues. Uh, about humanitarian access and the needs on the ground. This will also be a discussion at the London 11. Uh, the Secretary feels very strongly, as do many uh, countries around the world, that uh, raising the focus on humanitarian access is, uh, is a step that we need to uh, continue to take. Uh, one thing, actually, while well, you've asked about this, he actually spoke with um, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, as well this morning in preparations for the uh, Geneva Conference in a week and a half. Um, he emphasized with him the importance of humanitarian assistance. Uh, he, he briefed him on his engagement recent, in recent days uh, with regional players on Syria. As you know, they're meeting on Monday, so they'll have a longer discussion uh, then. But uh, certainly it will be a part of the discussion through the course of the events this weekend. Of the 30,000 refugees you mentioned, um, uh, which have been identified by the UNCHCR, mm -hmm. how many of those have they identified for the United States particularly? Uh, they're not at that stage in the process yet, uh, so we're waiting for them, for the referrals, which is the next stage in the process. And do you have a ballpark number then of how many you would be willing to accept? Uh, I don't at this point. I think that's part of the process that we would work through, but it's important to note that we are uh, the largest recipient. Uh, we were in last year the largest recipient of refugees. Our process just takes some time. Do we have any more in Syria? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, it's a different topic. This has to do with a security incident in southern Russia. It's about okay. 150 miles from Sochi. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any details about these incidents where some individuals, uh, I guess, uh, some individuals were killed and found in cars? I don't have any additional details from here. I would refer you to the Russian government. Do you have any concerns, though, that this is the latest incident uh, that's heightened security concerns potentially for American athletes? as the Sochi Olympics get underway in a couple of weeks? Well, we, the United, I think we've stated this before, but it's important to reiterate here. We've had discussions on counterterrorism cooperations in a number of venues with the Russians, uh, including in working groups of the Bilateral Presidential Commission. Uh, we've also been working with the Russian government through the International Security Events Group on preparations for the Olympics, as we do with any host country. Uh, and uh, our, co our counterterrorism cooperation uh, increased, of course, around the a terrorist attack at the Boston Marathon, uh, and we welcome any efforts uh, and willingness and openness to cooperate around the Olympics. Over the weekend, Secretary Hegel had a phone call with his Russian counterpart. Uh, he expressed condolences for the terror incidents in Volgograd, and he also offered assistance, mm -hmm. uh, U.S. military assistance, if requested. Has such a request come through to the State Department from Russia? Well, any assistance coming from the U.S. government would be coordinated, and it sounds like it may be more appropriate to come through the Department of Defense. Uh, the focus of the conversation today was on the preparations for a Geneva conference, which would be the appropriate conversation the Secretary would have. So I would just point you to any more details DOD uh, has to provide. So you don't have anything uh, specific or any details about these incidents that have taken place? I don't have any more. I would refer you to the Russian government. And are they of concern that the, this might be a pattern that's taking place because this Volgograd, obviously you have the Secretary of Defense expressing condolences for something that's happened mm -hmm. in 600 miles away, and then you have something in Stavropol, which is 150 miles away. Uh, I, again, I, I'm not going to outline 
detailed private conversations we're having on counterterrorism efforts with the Russians, but obviously we're engaged with that with them. Everybody, it's in everybody's interest to, uh, to do everything possible to keep the athletes safe and the attendees safe, and, uh, but beyond that, I don't have anything I can uh, read out for you. What exactly is the U.S. government doing to protect American athletes for the I think Olympics? I just outlined the efforts we're undertaking, as we would with any host country, uh, as we prepare for the Olympics. I have one more mm -hmm. for Snowden, sure. if that's okay. Um, and this might have been too late for you to have mm -hmm. any anything on, but there's um, the Civil Liv Liberties Committee of the European Parliament has approved a hearing um, for <coughs> Edward Snowden um, to be held presumably somewhere in Brussels or Strasbourg, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. at some date to be determined um, as yet. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, I don't have any particular comment other than to say it hasn't changed what our view is, which is that he should be returned to the United States. Uh, but beyond that, I don't have anything further on. But is it appropriate on. for um, um, an international body like the European Parliament to be holding a, an audition with Edward Snowden? I don't know how they would do it, mm -hmm. but um, whereas you, presumably the United States, would actually like him to be giving his testimony here. That is true, uh, although I don't have any other particular commentary on you this to, Do you think you'll be in contact with the European Parliament to see if you could at least uh, be present? Or? Uh, I, I don't have any update on that. I'll see if there's any plans to do that. None given, that I'm aware of, though, testimony Joe. testimony here, that's quite a generous way. <laughs> Can I ask you, uh, but going back to in the yesterday in India, uh -huh. uh, has the situation deteriorated to the point where you're re ready to um, start calling them out on this? Uh, I don't have any update to the comments I made yesterday in that. Okay, so you're still hoping that you're going to be able to resolve this quietly behind the scenes. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't put it that way. I would put it that our relationship with India is so important that we want to work through uh, issues as they come right. up. We'll, well do that through I diplomatic follow, channels. Can, are, are you disappointed by the fact that they have chosen the route that they have chosen? Uh, I'm not going to address that. I, any disappointment we have, we express privately, and we're addressing their concerns as they come right. up. Well, perhaps case. publicly you could say, are you happy with the way that they have handled this situation? I don't have any more commentary believe, than what I offered yesterday. Do you believe that it is worthy or becoming of a, of a country that aspires to be a great diplomatic power? As we have concerns, Matt will express those privately. Go ahead, Lisa. But do you, do you think that they're holding the relationship hostage to this one issue? I mean, it seems as if... They have said they're not. And they, we have worked with them, and we're working with them on other issues. So certainly like we what? don't. Uh, Space well, exploration. We remain in dialogue with them about all the issues we typically work on but together, whether that's you know, strategic interests or economic interests, and uh, that remains the case. Did, the, um, did they cancel the uh, visit of the um, energy secretary because of this diplomatic uh, It was agreed that we would do this at a later time when both sides, uh, uh, hopefully in the coming months, where both sides could uh, better uh, deliver a more comprehensive uh, package. So you're saying that it had nothing to do with this diplomatic row, it was because of other types of... I'm saying the decision was made because we want to make sure it's uh, under the best conditions and at the time where it can be most productive. Uh, obviously, uh, energy coordination and cooperation is an important uh, issue we work with the Indians on. Uh, great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.